This evening we're looking at a very short verse in 1 Thessalonians. You feel free to turn it up if you want, but I'll probably have it read by the time you get there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I just wanted to read um, a few verses here, 16 through 18. Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. I do want to focus on uh, verse 17. And actually, this, this sermon is not so much about uh, just praying without ceasing, although that's certainly a part of what we're going to be looking at. But it really has to do with how we are to pray to the Lord. And I hope that even though there's a great deal in Scripture about this, the, the particular points that I've selected this evening will be enough to encourage us and get us going in the right direction. And again, I, I believe that this is a part of what it is we've been looking at and what it is we've just been praying for, that the Lord would help us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, which means to become more like him and to become less like the world, less like what we were when we came into the world. Make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lusts. That's what sanctification is all about. The work of the Holy Spirit in us is to make us like our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have seen that in order to do this, in order to be like Jesus, really whose life is characterized by love, we do need to be filled with that love of the Holy Spirit. And last week, I believe, we uh, saw that particular point that um, we have to be careful not to allow any of the influences of the world, the sins that we would commit, the, the uh, things we might indulge in that are evil in the world to quench the work of the Holy Spirit. It is like pouring water on the flame or on the fire of our love and devotion for the Lord. If you want to love him, you want that fire to burn brightly. If you want it to burn brightly, you don't pour water on it. But obviously there's more to it than just not quenching the flame, we also need to feed the flame. The Lord sets us on fire when he converts us. That's his sovereign work. That's the work of regeneration that we actually saw on Wednesday evening where the Lord you know, begins that flame of love for him. Sanctification, of course, is the continuance of that burning fire, of, of building that flame up, of becoming more like Jesus. But I hope you realize by now in your Christian walk that that fire the Lord has given to you can burn more brightly or it can burn more weakly. And certainly one of the influences is how much we compromise, how much we actually give in to the world. But the other is whether or not we use the means that God has given to us to stoke the fire and how we use those means. Now I do want to remind you that there's a lot of things we could talk about when it comes to prayer. You know, how basically, you know, what are the elements of prayer and so forth? What is prayer? And, and of course, the uh, very important question of why, why we should pray. And that, for that, I would refer you to the study that Greg did, the 52 reasons why we should pray. There's certainly plenty of reasons. Now, what we're focusing on this evening is because prayer is going to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But not just any prayer is going to do has to be done in a particular way. And that's what we want to look at this evening. Now, certainly a series like this, talking about the means of grace, as you know, if there's 52 reasons why we should pray, probably there's probably more, and we could think of uh, different elements of prayer, and we could talk about maybe 52 ways to pray and so forth. We, we don't want to spend so much time in it that we lose the forest for the trees in this particular study. We want to get a good overview. So we're going to get, a, hopefully, a good shot in the arm tonight if you have those outlines, I don't know how many of you have them, you'll see there's something like 11 uh, points, 11 how-tos on there, and that should probably give us enough to get started. But we do need to realize that as long as we're in the world, we're going to need prayer for a variety of reasons. And certainly, if you want to be like Jesus, you've got to pray. So how should we pray? Well, again, you have 11 things in front of you. You should pray constantly, fervently, from a holy heart, humbly, in faith, expectantly, sincerely, and secretly, 
corporately, with the Spirit's help, with God's glory first in view, and as we just did this past week, or actually yesterday, it was, no, it was, yesterday, it was yesterday and the day before, with fastings. Now again, with 11 points, we're not going to be able to dwell very long on each one of them, otherwise we're going to be here for a very long time. So I'm just going to deal with each of them uh, briefly. Now our text this evening tells us that we need to pray without ceasing. And I realize that there are some Christian denominations that believe that what that means is that you have to be praying every single moment of your life. Uh, perhaps you've noticed some of the uh, grace, grace brethren ladies that walk around with the bonnets on their head and so forth. If you were to ask them why they wear that, they would say, because we believe the Lord tells us that we need to have our heads covered when we pray. And then they would also say, God calls us to pray all the time. And so we always have to have our heads covered. Uh, that's, again, their reasoning. But I don't believe that's exactly what the Lord means when he says, pray without ceasing. If that were the case, we wouldn't be able to sleep. We'd have to be in prayer all night. We wouldn't be able to work or focus on anything else because it would be constantly praying to the Lord. Although I do think it would do us a lot of good to pray more than we do. But what he means by this, of course, is to pray in every circumstance that we find ourselves in, to commit everything that uh, we're having to deal with to the Lord. We are to pray wherever we are. We are to be continually speaking with the Lord as a practice of life, communing with him. We should really be aware of a constant connection that we have to the Lord. We should always be speaking with him and listening for his voice, especially, of course, in his word. And one of the things we ought to be continually seeking the Lord for, wherever we are and whatever we're doing, is that we might be like him. Again, that we might think as he would think, that we might speak as he would speak, that we might do what he would do. You know, the one person you would think in the whole world that's ever existed that might not need to pray would be the Lord Jesus Christ because he's God in human flesh. And yet we find that he probably prayed more than anyone else. He was communing with his Father and as a man continually seeking him for his grace and his strength and his wisdom to do his will. If the God-man needed to do that, how much more are those of us who are just men. We need to pray continually. Now secondly, we need to pray fervently. We read in Acts 11.5 that when Peter was taken, when he was arrested and put in prison, it says Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And why were they praying fervently? Why not just, you know, sort of laxly? Why not just sort of casually? It was because there was something they wanted, and they wanted it desperately. They wanted the Lord to protect Peter and to get him out of prison. And so they sought the Lord earnestly. Scripture tells us that when we pray, we need to pray to be heard by the Lord. We need to pray almost in a certain sense to persuade God to do something, which, in fact, he's already told us he's willing to do. But that's the kind of force that we should use in our prayers to show him that this is what we want and we're not going to give him any rest until he actually provides it. Now, do you really want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ? Then you certainly need to imitate him in this way because who prayed more fervently than our Lord Jesus Christ? Who sought the Lord more than our Lord Jesus who sought him with all his heart? If we really don't want what we're asking for, we're really not going to pray very fervently. And if God sees that we really don't want what it is we're asking for, I don't think God is going to give it to us. We need to want it. And we need to ask continually and ask fervently with, with strong desire that God would give it to us. Thirdly, we need to pray from a holy heart. James 5.16 Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. I believe uh, another translation of that is the fervent, again, the idea of fervency. But notice that it comes from a righteous man. Now, who is righteous in the sight of the Lord? 
But really, it's only those who've trusted in Jesus. If we haven't trusted in Jesus, we are not righteous. We are evil in his sight. We do need to trust him, but I don't think that that's what he has in view only in this text, but rather one who is earnestly seeking the Lord, seeking to live a godly life. Does it matter to the Lord when you're praying whether you're taking seriously his commandments or not? Does it matter to him whether you obey him or not? Now, certainly Christians, all Christians, all true believers will obey. They won't do it perfectly, but we have to admit, sometimes we, we seek to obey more earnestly and sometimes we don't. When is the Lord going to be more apt to listen to your prayers? Except when you are walking with him and you're obeying him and you are seeking to live a godly life. If you are that kind of person, then your prayers will accomplish a great deal. And so if you want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, you really need to give yourself to the Lord. If you want to pray and be heard, you have to show the Lord your earnestness, that you want to be his and not the world's. When the Lord looks at your heart and he sees that your desire is to be like him, which is what I believe is, again, included in this idea of being a righteous man, then he will give you what it is that you desire, especially because you're going to be asking for the things that he wants to give you. He'll be delighted to give it to you, especially when you ask him to be like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you need to pray from a holy heart and not one that is filled with worldly desire. You need to pray humbly. Again, the, um, the parable or perhaps the, uh, the actual thing that Jesus was speaking of in Luke 18, verses 10 through 14, where he's talking about the Pharisee and the tax collector who went into the temple to pray. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, if you come to the Lord like this Pharisee, thinking that because you're so good and you're so special that you deserve to be heard, you deserve that your prayer should be answered, the Lord is not going to hear you. There is nothing perhaps more obnoxious to God than pride. We read in James and in Peter, God resists the proud. He is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so if we're going to come to the Lord in prayer, we do have to come humbly. God gives grace to the humble. We need to realize we don't deserve his mercy in and of ourselves. We really can't ask in our name, God, give this to me because I deserve it. You know, he's not going to hear that kind of prayer, but give it to me even though I don't deserve it. Christ deserves it. We need to recognize that whatever God has to give to us is all of his grace, all of his mercy, and has nothing to do with us. And when the Lord sees that humility, he will hear and he will answer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, again, we're talking about becoming like Jesus. He's the one who, being in the form of God, humbled himself to become a man. And as a man, humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. He became a curse for us. So if we are to be like him, we do have to humble ourselves. And if we are to be like him, we need to pray that God would give us more humility. You know, there's a couple of things that people say you should never pray for, and that is don't pray for more faith and don't pray for more humility. <laughs> but the fact is, if you do and God answers that prayer and he gives it to you, I mean, that's, that's exactly what you should want. If that's what you need, he'll give it to you. He has a way of doing things, maybe in the way we don't necessarily like, but it's always effective. And we should like the results even if we don't like the way it comes about.
pray for humility. We need to pray in faith. Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus says, therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. Now I don't believe that the Lord is going to answer, he hasn't bound himself to answer uh, those, of course, who simply pray for themselves and pray for the things that they want that aren't actually given in the word as a promise to us. I mean, if we're to pray in faith, we can't say, God, <clears throat> I want that pink Cadillac or I want that silver Mercedes or whatever it may be, you know, that, that we think is such a great thing. And if I have enough faith, God's going to give it to me. I can't have faith that God is going to give me those things unless he's promised to give me those things. And I don't find in the word anywhere where he says he's going to meet all of my lusts and desires in that way. Rather, he tells me he's going to thwart those things. And rather, he's going to meet my needs and give me what I need to be godly. Well, the Lord has actually made a promise to you and to me that if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will make us like Jesus. Remember, Jesus is, the, is uh, the firstborn among many brethren. And if he's predestined you, he's predestined you to become conformed to the image of his son. We know that that's God's will. And if you know it's his will, if you know it's his promise, that's something you can pray and ask for knowing that God wants to give it to you. Knowing that when you ask, you have received because you have asked according to his will. You do need to pray in faith. And again, remember that if you ask that God would give you more faith so that you can pray in this way, that he's going to bring something into your life, just exactly what you need to make you more like Jesus Christ. So we do need to pray in faith. Now the next one is kind of like it, but it has a little bit of a different twist in Luke 18.1. Now, he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. And the parable he goes on to express is the woman who came to the unjust judge. And she says, give me safety from my opponent. Give me relief. And the unjust judge looked at her and said, this woman is wearing me out. I really don't want anything to do with her. But because she's continually coming to me, I will give her what she wants. And the Lord said, listen to the unjust judge. If he's going to um, give this woman what she wants because she's just simply being persistent, how much more will God give to you who are his children, who cry out to him for what is good and what is right? How much more will he answer your requests? In other words, there is this expectation that the Lord will hear and he will answer. And by the way, that is an aspect of faith, isn't it? When you pray according to God's will and you know you're asking for something he's promised to give to you, you should expect to see the answer to that prayer. You should on the basis of what Jesus Christ has said in this, in this parable. If an unrighteous judge will listen to this woman who's constantly bothering him, how much more when the saints bombard the throne of grace asking God for things he's promised, one who is just, how much more is he going to answer your prayers? You should expect that he will answer them. And so when you pray, don't pray doubting, but pray expecting that God will hear. Again, he's promised to make you like Jesus. When you pray and ask that, you should expect to see the changes taking place in your life. Now, you should also pray sincerely and secretly. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Jesus says, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. <clears throat> Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to the Father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now certainly this tells us that when we pray, we must not pray to be seen or heard by others. 
to impress other people with, with our particular you know, eloquence or our piety because we're asking for certain things. Nor do I think that the Lord intends for us in our prayers to instruct other people as far as what they should be doing. We need to pray to the Lord, directly to the Lord, sincerely from the heart, as though he is the only one listening to us. And I think we should do that under any circumstances. But one of the things that the Lord points out to ensure that it be, that he be the audience, especially when you're praying for yourself and you're praying that, that the Lord would make you more like Jesus, that you should pray in secret where only God can see. Do most of your soul searching prayer in the closet with the Lord and not openly for others to see because if you do it in the closet, only the Lord will see it. And if you're doing it in the closet, if you're doing it in secret, that means you really do want to be like the Lord Jesus. And you're not just saying that so that other people say, wow, you're pretty holy. You want to be like Jesus, right? I think the next point kind of brings us out a little bit more clearly when the scripture tells us we should also pray corporately, not just secretly, but also together. Acts 1.14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And of course, they were praying that God would fulfill the promise that he had made, Jesus had made. Uh, wait in the upper room and, and pray until the promise of the Father has come upon you, until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I do believe that most of the prayers that we offer to the Lord are to be offered in the closet. They are to be offered in secret. I think that should be the majority of our prayer. But that doesn't mean that we can't pray publicly. I believe the Lord wants us to seek him together. We've already done that this evening as a part of worship. But I do think when we meet together, we should be meeting to pray mainly <clears throat> for one another and not just for ourselves and not just for our own needs and not just for our own desires. We should really, I think, spend the time in the closet doing that, as well as praying for other people's needs. I mean, don't just get in the closet and pray for yourself. But when you're with the people of God, don't just pray for yourself. You know, pray for others. Pray for them, that God might bless them. Pray with the whole body in view, corporately. Next, you should pray with the Spirit's help. Ephesians 6.18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view. Be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, I think you understand that you really can't offer to God the kind of prayer that he will hear and answer unless you have the spirit of God to begin with. But I do believe that, that Paul, when he says pray in the Spirit, if he's directing this to believers, he knows they already have the Spirit. But I think he recognizes that certain prayers can be in the Spirit and other prayers not, depending upon how much of the influence of the Holy Spirit that you have. And so when you pray, you need to ask for the Spirit's help. And having asked for his help, you need to rely upon the Spirit of God to assist you in your prayers to add the fervency that we've seen and the humility, that zeal, that desire, um, that sincerity, all those things that the Lord would have us to do. We need the Spirit of God in order to do that. Now, again, if the work of the Holy Spirit is primarily to make us more like Jesus, then how much does the Spirit of God want to help us in this way, to pray as we should pray? This is something he will help us to do, so we should rely upon him to do it. I think scripture tells us that we should pray with God's glory first and foremost in view. Uh, Jesus, when he's teaching his disciples to pray, begins this way. He says, pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words... Let God's glory be the burden of your prayers before you begin to hand him your list of the things that you might like to have. And certainly the Lord wants to hear what your needs are. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts and lead us not into temptation and so forth. But the burden of the prayer begins with God's glory. 
And we need to ask ourselves the question when we're praying to become like Jesus Christ, why do we want to become like him? Is it for our own benefit? Is it again so that others can look at us and say how holy you are? Or is it that God's will would be done because this is what he wants from you. This is how he would be glorified. And by the way, if you think you become like Jesus Christ and you have the attitude, I hope people notice, <laughs> you know, that shows that you're not really as much like him as you might hope that you could be. Because Christ is humble. And certainly, as humble followers of Jesus, he doesn't intend for us to draw attention to ourselves. So when we pray that he would make us like him, we should pray this for God's glory, that his will would be done. That's certainly what Christ's, the burden of Christ's prayer was. My meat and drink is to do the will of the Father, and his prayers were continually that his Father would be glorified through him. And that's what we need to pray as we pray to become like Jesus Christ. I hope you're taking notes here because if you just hear this and forget, it's not going to help at all. We need to hold on to the things that we've heard and seek to do them. Now, the last point is to pray with fastings. Again, Jesus gives us some direction regarding that in Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, to make sure that we don't pray so that others will see us and again think we're pious and holy and, and super saints. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. And, you know, thankfully, I didn't see any gloomy faces yesterday. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, Jesus talks about how we should fast. Again, don't fast to be seen by other people. Don't practice your righteousness before men to be noticed by them because when they notice you and they clap their hands and say, well, aren't you special, you've gotten all that you can expect to get. But let's ask the other question. Why does the Lord want us to fast in the first place? I hope that when you were, those of you who did fast, who were able to fast, uh, noticed that when you're fasting and when you deprive yourself of food for a short period of time, how weak you get, how hungry you get, how you realize how dependent you are upon the Lord to sustain you and to just provide the food that you need. I mean, just how dependent you are upon him for everything. It reminds you of that dependence. It empties you of pride. I mean, makes you realize just how weak you are and feeble about, you know, apart from the Lord. But in that dependence upon the Lord and in that weakness and in that humility, it has a way as it were, of intensifying your prayers. I don't know if you noticed the prayers. That, well, those of you who were at the prayer meeting might have noticed that on Saturday, but it changes the character of your prayers when you're fasting. They do become much more along the lines of what the Lord is showing us in Scripture as far as how he wants us to pray. It's much more focused on God's glory when we do that. It has a way of, again, intensifying those prayers and speeding them, as it were, to heaven. The Lord seems in Scripture to take more notice of those prayers when his people actually add fastings uh, to their prayers. This is something we don't necessarily need to wait for the whole church to do. I mean, this is something we can do any time. We can seek the Lord in this way. And that's something I do believe that if we engaged in it regularly, we'd actually find more spiritual power. Now, you need to be careful. You can't fast every day of your life for the rest of your life, obviously. But if you do understand the power that comes through fasting, perhaps you'll be more apt to do it. It's something perhaps you could pray about um, using. I had a friend one time that um, was looking for the secret of spiritual power. How can I become like these saints that did such great things for the Lord? And he happened to notice that in the scripture, the two greatest of, of all the characters of the Bible, and in my character, I don't mean they're not real, of course, they're certainly real, but of all the, the men in Scripture, of all the people in Scripture, I mean, who are the two greatest? We might bicker over who the second one is, but certainly Jesus, you know, is the first. Moses, maybe the second. 
And yet, what did these two men do that, that no one else in the Bible did? Well, the one thing he noticed was that they fasted for 40 days. <laughs> ah, there's the secret. If I can just fast for 40 days, I will be like Jesus. I will be like Moses. God will use me. I don't know if he realized this, but Moses did two 40-day fasts back to back, and he didn't eat in between. So he actually went 80 days. I wouldn't recommend that you do that, by the way, because uh, 40 days might just put you in an early grave if you try to fast that long. But that's not the secret, of course, of their spiritual power. However, I would say it certainly was a contributor. You don't need to fast 40 days to be spiritual, but I would say that if you fast more frequently and you pray, that you will become more like Jesus. You will become more spiritual. And so basically, here are the first two steps of how we are to put on Jesus Christ and how we are to put off the flesh. The first one had to do with stop compromising with the world and pouring water on that precious fire of the Holy Spirit in your soul and begin praying, praying with a particular focus in view, praying that the Lord would make you more like Jesus Christ, praying constantly, praying fervently, praying from a heart that is devoted to God, praying humbly, believingly or in faith, expectantly, knowing that God's going to hear and answer those prayers, sincerely, you know, not to be seen by others, but just by the Lord, secretly, not to be seen by others, corporately, and again, remember the distinction between them, with the Spirit's help, with God's glory first in mind, and with fastings, that you might be like the Lord. Now, the more you do this, the more or the hotter, I should say, that fire within you is going to burn. And the more you're going to be like Jesus. Again, these things are biblical. These things are the instruction that the Lord has given to us in order to achieve the end. It's not going to happen automatically. When you prayed the prayer, that wasn't all that you needed to pray. When you exercised faith the first time, that's not all that was needed to make you like Jesus or to fulfill all that the Lord has for you. The Lord has actually given to you a rather large book full of instruction. And just knowing what the Bible says is not enough either. I mean, Jesus said, do you know these things? Blessed are you that you know them. He didn't actually say that. He said, blessed are you if you do them. We have to do them if they're going to make any difference in our lives. We need to know them so we can do them. But we should never think that just because we have discovered what God's will is, that that is all that is necessary. Jesus, again, told Capernaum that they're going to be more culpable in the day of judgment because they knew so much but did nothing. More knowledge just makes us more blamable for not doing what we know. The, the purpose of gaining the knowledge is so that we might actually put it into practice. So we might take this uh, list and carry it with us and try to do what it is that the Lord is calling us to do. And by the way, I should mention this too, that the Lord is there to help you. He will help you do what he calls you to do in this way. You can't do it in your own strength, which is why we need to pray in the Spirit. He will give you the grace you need to pray in a way that the Lord will hear. He will give you that fervency. He'll give you that humility. He'll give you that faith and that expectancy. He will do all these things for you, give you the strength to do it. It doesn't mean, again, that you kick into automatic pilot and he does it without you, but he works it in you. And that's what we need. We need that grace. We need that help. And the more we do this, again, it's like a virtuous circle the stronger we'll get. The less we do this, the weaker we'll get. It's like a vicious circle. So we need to stay in the right circle. We need to keep moving upwards. We need to keep praying that the Lord would give us the grace to pray in a way that would be most fruitful, that the Lord might make us more like him. Well, may the Lord grant us that grace and that mercy uh, to do so. Let's, um, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer. And pray fervently, humbly, secretly, and so forth that um, the Lord would grant to us that we would be able to do what we've been exhorted to do this evening.